What's up YouTube? In today's video, I'm gonna be sharing how to get your team to try Webflow. This is a question I get asked a lot, so I'll share some tips and tricks that worked for me. Before we get started, I think it's important to note that Webflow is not the perfect fit for every type of project out there. Sure, there's integrations we can try and hack together and force things to work, but in my experience, when we try and make Webflow fit into a role it wasn't designed for, it leads to frustrations later on down the road. Here's three types of sites I think are sometimes better to be fully custom coded instead of Webflow builds. First, large sites with complex CMS structures. Webflow has some hard limits around collections that it's working to improve, such as no more than 20 collections per site. These are dynamic info such as blog, news articles, team members, and press releases. Also, no more than 100 collection items per an unpaginated list, and no more than 10,000 items per a site as a whole. For older sites that have a bit of history and we're redesigning them, these could be hard limits that make us build out a custom site somewhere else. Also, I noticed some e-commerce sites are still better built in other platforms, such as sites that need to integrate with hardware POS systems inside of restaurants or businesses. Also, uh, e-com sites that need to allow users to quickly reorder from their previous order history. These are some limits that we can sometimes face with Webflow e-com. Also, I noticed that sites that are web apps and are software builds often need to be fully custom coded because these have custom backends that we just don't have the options to build inside of Webflow at the moment. Now, none of these are hard set rules. These are just guidelines that we can research and really understand our project's requirements, things to be aware of before diving into a Webflow build. On the flip side of that, here's three types of sites I personally find work really well inside of Webflow. First, small to medium sized marketing websites. There's not a hard number or a page count I can place here. It all depends on the functionality requirements, but often I find these sites are great in Webflow as well as storytelling sites because of the highly engaging scroll interactions that bring the visuals to life in an impactful way. These are a great fit for Webflow. And my personal favorite lately has been experiential microsites. These sometimes require a little bit of custom code but are totally doable in Webflow to build tools, games, and then just fully custom experiences that bring things to life in Webflow. Just to give an example of sites that aren't a good fit in Webflow versus sites that are, here we have an NFT website where viewers need to be able to place a bid on an auction of art that they would like to purchase. Artists need to be able to submit their art and collect money on the art that was bought. And then this whole functionality could be pretty complex to build inside of Webflow, even with the new membership and e-commerce features that are gonna be rolling out soon. However, this entire site has a microsite on a subdomain that could be built in Webflow. This is this whole interactive quiz that really uh, introduced me to the main site in the first place, where you had to guess what's more expensive, your traditional styled art or your more modern styled art. And at the end of this, you even get to basically challenge a friend to compete and post your score on social media. Now, some parts of this would require a little custom code to build inside a Webflow, but I still think that microsites like this are such a great fit to build inside a Webflow and are a great addition to a main, larger, or more complex marketing site. Finally, not every type of company will be willing to adopt Webflow either. Here's two types that I've personally found fit into this category. First, those who value quantity over quality. There's entire agencies whose business model is built around being able to quickly spin up websites from templates and things like Elementor or Squarespace. For them, Webflow often has too high of a learning curve for the level of detail that they need. Also, those with small problems and low budgets. When I first started freelancing, one of the companies I worked for needed to have custom coded landing pages with no CMS, no forms on it, just a simple phone number call to action. For them, they had hosting where they were able to have as many of these sites as they wanted. And really using something like Webflow was just too high of a cost for them for the level of detail they needed. No matter how much I would try to persuade them, it would be like 
walking into a store and just wanting to buy a hammer to hang a painting up on your wall, and then the salesman trying to sell you sort of a nail gun. You can talk about how fast, how efficient it's going to be, but really all you need is the hammer for something so simple. And for a lot of companies with small needs and low budgets, they're just not going to turn to Webflow. Thankfully, there's so many companies where Webflow is the perfect fit for them. This could be agencies that are serious about building cutting-edge websites, or even huge companies that need microsites and landers to go along with their main site. For them, Webflow can be used to build out MVPs, to demonstrate interaction ideas to developers, to build out a UI that hands off to a backend dev, or even to build the real website or product itself. While the potential for reward from using Webflow is pretty high for them, so is the potential risk that could come with it. Because these agencies and companies have processes that have been established for a long time and even full developer teams. So here's a few steps that I've used in similar situations to help introduce Webflow. Step one, listen before you speak. The goal here is to ask a lot of questions and try to identify pain points. There's probably someone who's been around longer than you who understands why certain things are set up the way they are, and you can try and look for places where Webflow might add value. I remember one of my jobs during college was to be the web designer for my church. The previous web designer had started building out our new website inside of WordPress, and I was tasked with picking up where she left off and building out the rest of the site in WordPress. So I sat down with our creative director and I asked, can you tell me a little bit about the new site? How will it work? What will the process look like whenever we need to add a new event to the site? And he said, well, to create a new event, you'll have to create the page for the event. Then you'll have to go to the all events page and add it there and link it up to the new page and also go to the home page under the latest events section and add it in there too. And I started to get a better idea of how the new site was going to work and how Webflow might add value. Now, there was a lot of places Webflow could add value from better interactions, better UI, just an all around smoother process. But through asking those questions, I was able to identify the specific pain points that our creative director cared about and address how Webflow might serve those specifically. Step two, show, don't tell. Many people run off the premise of, I'll believe it when I see it. So any examples you can show, any demos you can run to demonstrate the pain point that Webflow is going to solve, that's the best case scenario. When I first got my job for the agency I worked for, 368, I quickly realized that many of them thought Webflow was another WYSIWYG builder like Squarespace that had little power to build fully custom designs. So what I decided to do was take one of the most complex sites they had built and rebuild the homepage of it in Webflow. I timed to myself to show how fast Webflow is to develop in compared to traditional development. I screen recorded the entire process to show that the process was so similar to custom coding and how it followed a clean structure all the way throughout the build. At the end, this part was key in introducing Webflow to the agency because they were able to quickly see visually what it could do instead of me just trying to over explain or be persuasive about it. Lastly, start with a low stakes project. At 368, we started with a couple internal projects, followed by a smaller client build in Webflow to eventually building most of our sites in Webflow. And my request at first wasn't to switch the whole agency over to Webflow. It was just to try it on a smaller project. And the goal here is to reduce the perceived risk as much as possible. So the way to do that is we have to really do our research and make sure whatever we're planning to build can actually be built in Webflow. And that ties back into everything we talked about so far. Also, mind the details because one of the greatest things that separates Webflow from uh, traditional development is that we have so much time left over to enhance the little details and make sure that the site not only just functions well, but also just feels right when we're using it. And that is sometimes the hardest part to master. So that's the part that Webflow really allows us to hone in on. Also, low stakes does not mean low ambition. And one of the first internal projects that we tackled in Webflow was sort of this chore chart. So the goal with this chore chart here was that before anyone would have to walk downstairs and 
flip over their card when they were done with their chore, walk back up, complete the chore. And it was a big hassle to update and different things like that. So we thought, what if we could rebuild this in Webflow and link it up to our project management software, use Zapier and connect everything together where you can mark up a task from your computer or even come down to a tablet to see what was left for the day. So we rebuilt this in Webflow. After a couple weeks, it was really low risk because if this didn't work out, we could just go back to using the older chore chart. Or um, it only really costed a couple hours a week, internal hours for us to work on. So it wasn't a huge risk, but it was something to really test out and see what Webflow could do. So there you have it. Those are three steps that have worked for me when introducing Webflow to a team. If you've liked this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you never miss another video. Also, I'll post the link to my recent talk at Webflow's No Code Conference if you'd like to check that out in the description below. I'll catch you in the next video. Goodbye.